All right, what's up, AP Euro? Here we go. We're going to do a little nationalism right here, right now. So let's dive in. Okay, so really, we have three major things to look at. One, we're going to look at the Crimean War and how that kind of changed the trajectory of Europe and the prevailing politics of the time. Two, Italian unification. Three, German unification. So here we go. The Crimean War. The Crimean War, although it's something that we wouldn't really focus a ton on, it is important just because it's like one of those moments in time where things had looked consistent, static, and then everything changes. Okay, so really there's kind of two things going on here. The outward argument is that Russia believes that inside the Ottoman Empire, especially in the Holy Lands, that the Ottomans are not allowing the open and free practice of Orthodox Christianity, they try to make a sales pitch to Britain and France that they're also not allowing Catholics to practice. Really what it is, is Russia wants to expand, wait for it, its influence in the Crimean area, right? They want Black Sea access. And so they're trying to expand further into what is now modern day Romania. And that's why when we look at who's stacked up in this war, we actually have England, France, and Piedmont, Sardinia siding with the Ottoman Empire. Now, there's kind of an interesting thing here. From an argument of legitimacy, right, you'd have to say that there isn't a legitimate claim for why Russia should be expanding. Um, they're also in, in a need for a balance of power, another guiding principle of the Congress of Vienna, Russia's getting fat here. I mean, like, it's getting dangerous to see Russia continually expanding and exerting more and more influence. There's a, a thought that they're going to connect now with the Greeks through the Bosporus and maybe kind of link a, a Slavic corridor through Eastern Europe. And so nations are not real thrilled about that. Piedmont, Sardinia, we haven't talked about yet, but we will quite a bit in this video. They're one of the more modern industrial northern territories of Italy. <clears throat> And they joined this Crimean War really as a way to show France and Britain, look, we are a nation on the rise. We can be trusted. We're, we're doing things for you, and we would like you to do some things for us, <clears throat> i.e. help us against Austria and eventually maybe be okay with us unifying Italy. Okay, so the Crimean War, we won't talk much about it. As you'd imagine, it takes place in the Crimea. Really, the big things about the Crimean War that are significant. One, it's really the first time that we see battlefield medics and nurses. I saw the famous Florence Nightingale. It's also the first war where we see like major industrialization, right? We have trains bringing supplies to the front line. We have telegraph lines sending and relaying messages. Steamships moving troops from Western Europe into the conflict zone. And so from that standpoint, it's like the first industrial war. Although, truthfully, Russia is not very industrial. And that's one of the things that stands out from this moment. So in the Treaty of Paris, Russia nor the Ottomans really get to claim the area. It becomes kind of a neutral pond in the Black Sea. And everyone agrees that the Ottoman Empire has a right to exist. There is a legitimate claim for their stability. But what is more clear is that the concert system of Europe is dead, right? We've had a generation, 40 years of peace, and now that is destroyed. Russia is clearly not a modern industrial nation like Britain and France, right? They're having a horrid time moving troops into, into conflict zones because uh, they don't have rail. Their economy is faltering. Um, so there's a real struggle there. And then in the Western parts of Europe, this is the beginning of something known as real politic. And that's the idea that using foreign events as instruments of domestic policy. So, for example, Piedmont and Sardinia looking to bolster their influence in Italy and to gain recognition in their kind of local, re excuse me, region, decide that they're going to partake in a foreign conflict uh, for their own local aspirations. All right, so here we go. Italian unification. We're going to run through these quick, and the way we're going to start this off is to look at some of the big dogs that will be playing in here. So Count Cavour, all right, he is the minister of Piedmont, Sardinia. All right, so he is wealthy, liberal, high level in society, um, minister that's running Piedmont. And he is working then in the same territory as Victor Emmanuel II. He is the king of Piedmont and Sardinia. 
and this is his minister. Okay, Giuseppe Mazzini had been working in Rome and through central Italy. Um, and I call him the heart of Italian unification because he wrote great poems, he gave speeches, he worked with labor unions and trade unions to try to develop a sense of a unified Italy, where Cavour was much more of the architect, the guy who had the ideas, a timeline of events. He kind of knew how he wanted to piece it together. And then lastly, Giuseppe Garibaldi is the sword because him and his red shirts, which was a militarized group of protesters and pro-unification Italians, they'd actually do the battle uh, work, the military work to unify Italy, and mainly by liberating places like the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies from the House of Bourbon, right, which was um, controlled basically by the Spanish throne directly, right? So he'll be the militant arm of all of this. The Pope didn't want to see Italian unification. His theocratic rule in central Italy was pretty well, you know, supported, and he didn't want to see that lost. Also, the French were, were there to prop him up, but we'll talk more about that later. All right, so let's dive in. All right, so I'm going to break it into a couple steps. Step one the Carbonari insurrections. The Carbonari were a secret society, and it literally translates into the coal men or the dudes of carbon. Um, and they were started as a trade union of coal miners, and it became the secret society of, of people looking to unify Italy through the trades, right? So coal miners in Piedmont and coal miners in Venezia and coal miners in Genoa, right, all had similar feelings about being an Italian coal miner, so they were going to bring themselves together. Now, notice the years, 1820, 1821, you notice they're in handcuffs. This is right there in the heart of the concert system. And so like many of the revolts of this time period, right, foreign troops, conservative troops came in and squashed these. I mentioned before Piedmont Sardinia would join the Crimean War, although it's not really a conflict that concerns them. They did it in order, right, to, to be recognized as a European player, an up-and-coming state, and I think to make an angle with nations like Britain and especially France, look, we helped you. Now we have a little favor to ask. How would you feel if we started to kick out the Austrians? Um, how would you feel if we started to combine some Italian territories? Okay, so step three then, two years later, Cavour, right, the minister of Piedmont, meets with Napoleon III, Emperor Napoleon III. That's Louis Napoleon, leader of France, right? And so they have this secret meeting, and the question really is here, will France support Piedmont's actions against Austria? And they will. So France will dedicate troops and money to support Piedmont's war against Austria. And in return, Napoleon wants um, Piedmont to give some territories right kind of on the sliver border of Italy and France, places like Nice and Savoy. Those are to be handed over to France as kind of an exchange of goodwill here. Um, seems like um, Cavour is playing Napoleon a little bit here. He doesn't really have an intention of doing that. He's an, intending to liberate northern Italy from the Austrians and then see if the Italians want to go to France or if they have a different idea and they want to unify under Piedmont's banner, right? become one unified state under Piedmont, which is exactly what he's going for. So here's Savoy and Nice. And here's Piedmont and Sardinia. And notice they're expanding. They're going to knock the Austrians out of Venice, Venezia, up here in the north. Right? So this was held by the Austrians. Then you'll notice down here, these later acquisitions. So in a moment, I'm going to talk about Garibaldi. All right, Garibaldi will raise his red shirt military and then kind of like hopscotch his way up the boot of Italy, liberating territories from um, Bourbon and Austrian control, and eventually those places voting to become part of Piedmont, a greater unified Italian state. Now notice Rome, not in the mix here. All right, so we'll get to that in a second. So the war happens in the north here between Piedmont and Austria. This war, the Austro-Prussian War, although not really connected here, right? Prussia's up, up north here, Germany. That war distracts Austria, right? So Austria and Prussia are fighting over control of who really is the, the superior godfather state of the German Bund. 
and that will distract um, Austria to not really be able to protect its holdings in Italy. Um, as I mentioned before, Garibaldi will hop his way up through Italy in step six, and then finally step seven, oh, excuse me, step seven, French troops had been stationed in Rome to keep the Pope propped up um, and safe. However, in 1870, there's a war called the Franco-Prussian War being fought back here in France. The Prussians are invading France, and France needs to withdraw its troops to support the homeland. And as those troops are pulled out, the Italians move into the city of Rome, and Italy is unified. And I always like this cartoon because here's Victor Emmanuel II. Right? He was the king of Piedmont, Sardinia. And here's Garibaldi, and he's laid down his sword, and instead of unifying it under him or a republic like he had wanted, they're going to unify as a monarchy or a constitutional monarchy. So he's slipping Italy's boot onto the king. Now, people have always wondered, why did they do this? Why did they go with Garibaldi's idea of a republic? I think it has to do with the idea of legitimacy still of the Congress of Vienna, right? Having a king is legitimate. Victor Emmanuel's family was legitimate. They were the kings of Piedmont and Sardinia going before the French Revolution. And so by giving Italy over to an already established monarchy would give an idea of legitimacy. And so by 1871, we have a unified Italy. And I put that like in some air quotes because Italy is like, yes, unified, just like America is happy and unified. All right, so the same problems that will exist in Italy are true in Germany, are true in America. There are some major differences. Northern Italy, <clears throat> places like Piedmont, Sardinia, Milan, these will be very industrial, technologically driven, educated, liberal, kind of on the front edge of modernity. Southern Italy is poor, it's rural, it's farmy. They're used to being controlled by conservative monarchical powers. Um, they don't get along very well. Northern Italy is not super religious. Central Italy, obviously, was controlled by the papacy. <laughs> Southern Italy, um, being kind of rural and farmy, um, certainly was, was much more um, dedicated to conservative ideology. And so it's going to be hard moving forward to try to get Italians to really feel like they're unified. So if any of you are Italian or you have Italian family or friends, you know that even still today, if you say like, oh, you're, oh, I, you're, you're, you're Sicilian? Oh, so you're Italian, right? No, I'm Sicilian. Like sometimes people don't even really recognize that idea of Italian, like, oh, I'm Sicilian, I'm Neapolitan, right? They don't really look at it as Italy because it's such a young country and such a divided nation as well. I guess it would be like the difference of Massachusetts and Texas.